I'm sure is going to share with us how for 30 years he has followed this path. He has exemplified to the highest that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works just given a chance. This man, in the 30 years, has not only brought this program to himself, but he has given it away numerous times, as many of us in this room know. I'm speaking of our speaker tonight, Jack Dolan. First thing I want to do is to give this microphone back to Betty. <laughs> My name is Jack Boland, and I'm an alcoholic. And I really do feel so good that I can hardly stand it. Someone from OA, Overeaters Anonymous, came up to me a moment ago and said that always when they're giving an important talk that they say, break a lip. She gave me a big kiss. And I love that. I wish I could kiss every one of you, every one of you, boys and girls alike. It would make no difference to me this evening because I love you. And I love the important role that you have played and continue to play in my life. I'm not here because I work. I'm here because the program works and because I need to continue to be a living part of a living fellowship of men and women who are practicing these principles in all of their affairs. And I can tell you that Some of the most important people in my life in this program are not recovering alcoholics, but they are persons who are recovering from the alcoholism that has infected their lives through the alcoholic in their life, and I'll speak more about that in a few moments, but some of the most important people in my life are the normal, quote-unquote, if there is such a person people who are caught up with me in the spiritual life and the process of growth that has been the great dynamic that has given excitement to my life. I looked up and saw this Milky Way that is here and someone asked me, what is that Milky Way doing there? And I know why it's there. Once a few years ago, in a talk, I told the story about the time shortly after I was first sober when I was in a drugstore at the counter. And you know how they do in drugstores. They have all kinds of things around the checkout counter that they know you will buy on impulse. And I've always loved Milky Ways. And so I reached for a Milky Way and paid my bill and went out peeling the Milky Way to get in my car. And it was a hot summer day, and the windows were rolled down, and I turned on the ignition and was about to pull out in the heavy traffic, and I took a bite of that Milky Way, and it tasted so good that I could hardly bear it. And I just stood there and cried. It tasted so good that I cried. And I want you to know that that might happen to me tonight because I'm one of the world's great criers. My life is so good. And I love it. And I want to share with you the excitement that I feel in my life and the excitement that I feel in your life also. But before I really get into my story, I introduced myself as Jack Boland, not Jack B. And I told you that I'm an alcoholic. And I would like to remind you that Although I broke my anonymity, I did not break the tradition of anonymity in the program of AA. I have here a brochure from General Service of AA, 
and states, The AA member who refuses to give his name on a personal level to provide help for a sick alcoholic is placing personalities before principles just as surely as is the AA member who identifies himself as such at the media level. And, of course, at the media level, my name is Jack B., and I am a recovering alcoholic in the program of AA. Only once have I ever had any problem with the media level, and never... (laughs) Well, you know about that. (laughs) Never at the level of radio, television, or the movies, especially the movies. From time to time, on television or radio, I don't hesitate to mention the fact that I am a recovering alcoholic. I do not mention my association with AA, but the words that I use let every AA or Al-Anon member in the listening audience in on the fact that I am there. It's it's one of those open secrets that we have. And I continue with this statement from this flyer. There's never been a single word in the traditions against the use of full names, either within the fellowship or on a person-to-person basis outside the fellowship. This experience suggests that an AA member, one, maintained personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, television, and films, and I just mentioned that, disclose their own identity, if you wish, with... Others you think might have a problem, as well as relatives, friends, concerned clergymen, doctors, employers, anywhere with the people that you love where it might prove helpful. I've never had any concern about my anyone being aware that I am an alcoholic. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that in 30 years of recovering myself and knowing many other recovering alcoholics, I have never seen one anonymous drunk. (laughs) Never. We're always the last one to know. I was the last one to know, I think, that I had the problem. And it's very important for we who are in the program to be aware that in our great nation there is no stigma if you are a recovering alcoholic, the idea that if someone discovers that you are an alcoholic, that somehow you will pay a price, either in terms of their respect for you, or somehow you will be deprived of your proper identity, is simply not so. Unquestionably, the institution in our nation that has garnered the most respect in the 40-some years of its existence is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. People love us and appreciate what we're doing. As a matter of fact, it is our anonymity is to protect the program from us. Anonymity is to not so much protect us from a stigma, but we maintain our anonymity so that the body of men and women and their families will be protected from the few self-seeking people who might take advantage of their membership in this fellowship. So if you're here for the first time, I want you to know that membership in Alcoholics Anonymous is something that, that really gives us a certain measure of of prestige. At least it explains what was happening to us. And 30 years ago, I needed an explanation of what was happening to me because I did not know what my experience was. A few moments ago, I mentioned that I suggested that alcoholism is a family disease. It's true. The last decade, we have become aware of the great impact that alcoholism has on the whole family, on the community in which that alcoholic lives and works. And if recovery is just for the alcoholic, himself or herself, that recovery is not complete until other members of the family begin to understand how deeply they have been influenced and begin their own process, their own program of recovering. If 
you show me two new people who perhaps walked into this meeting tonight for the first time, and one is an alcoholic and the other is the spouse. I'll show you two goofy people. Not just the drunk, not just the alcoholic. And I'll show you that the family member is just as disturbed in most ways, as was the alcoholic. If you don't believe it, go home and ask the kids. They'll tell you that, yes, it was father who, who drank all the booze, but it was mama that raised all the hell. And frequently, that family member believes, and I see a number of you Elanots nodding your head. You believe that as soon as you got George fixed, everything was going to be all right with you because he was your problem, and you had clung to that innocent concept that, is, that he's the problem, and everyone knew that he was the problem. The neighbors across the street, the neighbors next door, your family, and even your in-laws finally came to understand that you were the heroine there. There was nothing wrong with you. It was only George. And it works the same way if the alcoholic member is a woman. That person gets sober and begins to do something about themselves and their lives. And one day there's the startling realization that you are not doing very well by comparison. As a matter of fact, you weren't doing very well before that person began their recovery, because the deterioration in consciousness and in attitude that was indigenous to the alcoholic is also the experience of the non-alcoholic. Some of the most exciting people that I know are the non-alcoholics who have taken our program and they're doing with it what we sometimes give lip service to. You know, if there's a tragedy in AA today, for the past generation or so, that tragedy would be that we come into AA and our objective, our goal, is physical sobriety. We get dry and not sober. And it becomes a static sobriety in which there is, there is no movement in us. And, and we begin to justify our sobriety and we say, I am, I'm sober, aren't I? But the attitudinal changes do not take place. And the spiritual growth that is really the purpose of, of our recovery does not happen to us. You see, sobriety, meaning physical sobriety, is not our goal. It's the starting place. We cannot practice the program until we're physically sober. I can tell you that the great gift that was given to me of not having to take a drink and having that sobriety, physical sobriety, last for this period of time has been the, the single most important gift. But long ago it ceased being my goal. And I can show you in the big book why it ceased being my goal. Oftentimes we say that we stay sober a day at a time. And it was not until I discovered that I could not stay sober at all of myself. And discovered that what the book says is that what we have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. So therefore, for me, and, and I think it's true, as suggested in the big book, that our spiritual condition, arrived at daily, is our goal. And on page 42 of the big book, we are told that quite as important as our physical sobriety, quite as important as that fact, equal in importance, is the reality that spiritual principles will solve all our problems. And that was one of the great, remarkable discoveries of my life. First, that I could get sober if I could admit that I could not get sober. Now, that's one of the great paradoxes of of our program. I never got sober until I realized and acknowledged that I could not get sober. Step number one. That I needed help from God and from like-minded persons. And then the second great realization was that in my sobriety, this great gift that was given to me, I was afforded 
the marvelous option, the wonderful opportunity to launch out on a process of growth and change that would be never-ending. There would never be a time when I would reach the end of, of this experience, this dynamic. And for an alcoholic, that's the most exciting discovery, I think, of all, that, that we can take our lives and change our lives. And then when we've made that change, it's only the beginning of the process that's beyond. And spiritual principles will solve all of our problems in a most remarkable way, even in, I will say, a miraculous way. I did not know that until I came into this program, into this fellowship. Sometimes we, who love the alcoholic, tend to protect the alcoholic. Has that ever happened to you, family member, you Al-Anon? You ever go to the telephone and tell the boss that he had the flu? You know the first lie that I can remember telling after I took my first fourth step was when I was six years of age, my first year in school. I lied, six-year-old boy, lying to my teacher to cover for my alcoholic father. She asked me a very simple question, and I loved him so dearly that I covered for him. I've forgotten what she asked and what I said, but I was... I did not want anyone to know what was happening to my father. Most of all, I did not want to know it myself. I can tell you that after 30 years of watching us get well, that I've never seen one alcoholic recover until he or she begins to experience the consequences of their actions, the consequences of their behavior. And I can also tell you that all of we who have been in our practicing alcoholics, tend to control our environment, people around us, through fear and guilt. We really lay a guilt trip on them. The things that are happening to us would not be happening to us if if it had not been for them. It's because I married you that my life is this way. And it's because of the way you are since I married you. And if I had not married you, but had married her or him, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? The insidious way that we imply that if you don't really do what I want you to do, then I'm going to do the thing that you don't want to have happen, and if I do, you will experience the consequences. All disturbed people control their little environment by this mechanism of creating fear and guilt. So, I'm going to suggest to you that if you have an alcoholic in your family, that you stop right now playing that little game. Because that person will never get well until someone else makes a decision that the game playing, the role playing, the sickness is over. How many of us have waited for an alcoholic to get sober, waiting for that person to make a decision that we were afraid to make? And the reason we were afraid to make it was because they created the fear in us. Do you understand it? Do you know that I have rarely seen an alcoholic get sober because they awakened one beautiful, beautiful Monday morning, looked out the window. The weekend was just past. They were a little hungover. Lost a little bit too much in the poker game or on the football game. Their funds were depleted. But looking out the window, they said, gosh, it's a a glorious day. And do you know that I think that sometime over the weekend... I heard an announcement about alcoholism on the radio. There's a meeting somewhere in my vicinity. I think I'll saunter over there tonight and and sit on the back row and listen to what the speaker has to say because I might have a problem. Have you ever seen an alcoholic recover when they're in that state of mind? Do you know why we show up here? Because somebody else got sick and tired of how we were and how we are. And they got so sick and tired of it that they made a decision that if we didn't do something, they were going to do something. And that somebody might have been the judge. Or the boss, or the spouse, or a combination of persons. Again, in the last ten years, one of the most remarkable 
tools that is helping alcoholics recover. Men and women who would not have had a chance 30 years ago when I first came in is this system of intervention that is being used now. Intervention meaning two or more, fa- well, a bunch of family members. And I, I, I started to say two or more. You need as many strong people who live with that alcoholic as you can possibly get. People who are willing to look that person straight in the eye and speak what is in their heart. And more than family members, you also usually need a professional there to guide the process. See, the alcoholic has a belief system. One of the symptoms of alcoholism is a strong ability to believe the unbelievable about ourselves. When I first got sober, I was astonished to discover that I had a drinking problem for almost six months. (laughs) Isn't that ridiculous? When you hear me talk in a few minutes, I haven't gotten started yet. You'll find out how long I had a drinking problem. I could not see what was happening to me, and it was not until I saw my experience through the eyes of a few gutsy people. People who were willing to say some things to me. And I tell you, it was hard for them to say some things to me, because I made them pay a price when they said some things to me. I made them pay a price if they thought of. Anyone who came into my life lost some skin as a result of my alcoholism. Page 82 of the big book. The alcoholic is like a tornado rolling his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken. Sweet relationships are dead. Affections have been uprooted. Selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil. That is just a brief summary of the alcoholic state. It's the nicest description of alcoholism I've ever read in my life. We're disturbed. We're not very pleasant. and We are selfish. And we do not remember. We do not know what has happened to us. Many people think that alcoholics are people who who drink so much that they end up under the bridge. And a few, a very few alcoholics do. One or two percent. Maybe not that many. Alcoholics represent a cross section of our society. Men and women who come from every walk of life. And frequently, the symptom of drunkenness is not so pronounced. That particular alcoholic. Did you know that? Drinking is only one of the symptoms. And being drunk is not a symptom that you can rely upon. Remember when I first got sober, I saw a cartoon in Life magazine, I guess it was. And a woman was seated in the office of her attorney, and I knew it was because his name was on the door. And she was really irate speaking to her attorney about her husband and obviously was telling him that she wanted a divorce immediately. But her statement was this. She said, I didn't even know he drank. Until he came home sober one night. <laughs> Loss of memory. Blackout. One of the symptoms. The progressive deterioration of the ability to function well or normally. Thirty years later, I cannot remember how I got from New Orleans, Louisiana, to Greensboro, North Carolina. I do not remember leaving New Orleans. And it was some three days later that I suddenly became aware of myself. The city limits of Greensboro, North Carolina hitchhiking toward Roanoke, Virginia. Isn't that incredible? I do not know. I know I did not fly. 
At least I don't think I did. Now I want you to hear this. Through an incredible series of serendipitous events, the person that picked me up when I was hitchhiking was the last person on this earth that I wanted to see because that man was my former next door neighbor. When I left that neighborhood, one of my primary reasons was to get away from that guy. <laughs> and of course, when I left that neighborhood, I was like a big shot, and you show me a practicing alcoholic, and I'll show you a practicing big shot. And the closer they are to the bottom, the greater is their big shotism. And I see a lot of Alamans nodding their heads. You do know what I'm talking about, don't you? Now, I moved to California. Because one morning I awakened, well, it was, really wasn't morning. It was closer to the afternoon. It was a Sunday. Now, on that particular Sunday, the keen, cunning mind of the alcoholic had come to my rescue because when I awakened, I suddenly became aware of what my problem was. And my problem was that I lived in that community with those people not too far from my in-laws, next to my next-door neighbor who was a CPA. And you, if you're a practicing alcoholic, you don't want to live next door to a CPA. You don't know why? Unless he's a drunk. They do everything just right. They mow their lawn just right. They mow the front yard and the backyard and they trim the weeds. And by comparison, you know how a drunk looks by comparison to that. I went deep sea fishing once. Came home about three o'clock in the morning with this catch of fish and and naturally, I loved my next-door neighbor so much, I wanted to share my face with him. Now, what really was, I couldn't get any more in my freezer, and I had some left over. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, I went over and knocked on his door to give him my gift. And do you think he appreciated it? There had to be something wrong with him. It was not me. But this particular Sunday morning, I knew that all that I had to do was to leave that neighborhood and move to California. Not just down the street. I wanted real changes in my life. I'll tell you about the move to California in just a little while. But California had not worked. You see, it could not work. In less than six months in California, I had reproduced exactly the conditions that existed for me in Virginia, the conditions from which I was seeking to escape. Now, you're not going to believe that, are you? You are? The very thing that I was running from surrounded me when I arrived there. It was one of the most remarkable part of the educational process that took place in my life. It helped me later to understand how the program works. You see, what a person is, is what they become. It's what they experience. I always thought that my life was coming to me from the outside, the accident of my birth, the circumstances in which I found myself as a young and growing person. And again, the person that I married that obviously I should not have, the employment that I accepted that was beneath my abilities, my capabilities, all those factors. I had to go to California to see, starting fresh, that my exact state of mind was reproduced as though there was a mirror image there. Nothing in my life ever changed until I began to change inside myself. And I think that's what this program is all about, this process of growth and change and the putting off of the old ideas, the old attitudes. Physical sobriety would have saved my life, but in that process it would have given me no life. It would have given me no joy. The program has given me life and its joy. The personality change that took place in me. In looking back, I have to tell you that I was, I truly think I was one of the nicest young boys 
that I ever saw. I was. My parents died within two months of each other. When I was about seven years of age, my father directly from his alcoholism, he died beside the railroad track, between the railroad track and the river, in the small southern city of my birth. I saw him the night before they found him, and I grieved for him because he was drunk. I suffered for him. Two months later, my mother had a ruptured appendix because she could not seek proper medical attention at the time due to her active alcoholism. And she died from peritonitis, indirectly from her alcoholism, of course. My grandmother took me to raise, my maternal grandmother, a dear, precious lady who had run from her home all who drank. She would have nothing to do with demon rum. It's not what she called it, but no one was going to drink around her. Her physician gave her a toddy at the time of my mother's death to help her to overcome the trauma of that experience because there were no tranquilizers in those days. And my grandmother took that little toddy and she felt better. And she took another one and she felt even better than that. And she, for many years, did not stop taking that little toddy. So the time that I was eight and nine and ten and eleven years of age, I was the one that, in our family, that went down to the welfare department to pick up the welfare check. We had moved from the country club set where I spent my early years down near the railroad track, and then we crossed the track on the other side, and we were on the wrong side of that track as a result of my grandmother's alcoholism. But there was a sweetness in me as the child. I was really looking for the very same thing that each one of you is looking for right now. I knew I would never be like my father. I would never drink. I would never smoke. I would never cuss. There was a list of things that I would never do, would not do them. On my 10th birthday as a child, I'll never forget sitting late in the day in the backyard of the house in which we lived, and we'd only lived there for a few days, a very few days. The only thing that I knew for certain in my life was that We would not be living there much longer. We didn't live anywhere very long. We never leased the place that we lived. And I can tell you something else. When we moved, we didn't have to call Atlas Van Lines to move us. You could put it all in a poke. In Virginia, that's a bag. You could put it in a paper bag, and and that moved us. This day of my 10th birthday, I sat late in the day on a bank overlooking the main track of the Norfolk and Western Railway. And that track was no farther away than this front row. And it was about this high where I sat. No one had given me a birthday cake. No one had acknowledged the fact that it was my birthday. There was no gift. And I was barefooted in those cinders, not because I chose to be, but because I had no shoes. The agony that was in my spirit, my heart, was indescribable. Hopelessness was already in my life. Shame. I was ashamed of the people in my world, all of them. When I would go to school, I would take different ways to go to school so that the other children would not know from whence I came. I never asked anyone to come and visit me, nor did I accept invitations to go and visit someone else. I was already experiencing the sense of isolation and separation and loss of identity, and I spent a great deal of time in books seeking an identity far away from these events. You, you do know what I'm talking about, don't you? And late in the day as I sat there, a train leaving the station, going west, 
I could hear it when it released its brakes not too far. This was 9th Street and Shenandoah Avenue. The 10th Street Bridge was right there, and I've taken Karen back, and I've shown her the very place. This train was picking up speed, and passenger trains in those days were much longer than they now are. It was the primary means of transportation. And there were two engines on this train, and it was long, many cars, some baggage cars, and then the passenger cars. And on the end of that train, there were two dining cars. And as it passed me, increasing its momentum, and the clickety-click of the wheels on the rails was... I could hear that movement. Hear it now. And as I looked into those windows, just like I'm looking at you, I had this overwhelming desire to be on that train going west, meaning out of the conditions, out of the circumstances, out of the environment, away from these people and from this way of life. You see, the people that I saw there represented love and caring and, and a family life and all of the things that seemed to have been denied me in my own experience. And as the dining cars came even with where I was, the porters were there in their white jackets and people were already being seated around those tables. Oh, the strong desire that was in me and suddenly the train was passed and gone and I settled back down into the cinders of that experience of my life and the hopelessness. And yet there was a part of me that could not and would not surrender. But I knew that I'd never be like my father. I knew I'd never be like my father. I loved him, but I had an obsession to not be like my father. He represented all the things that I did not wish to experience. I was 16 when one night in high school, there were four of us, really nice young men. And one of them had borrowed his father's car, another had a fifth of 50 cent wine, and they had their cigarettes and they were lighting their cigarettes and they were, you've experienced the peer pressure yourself in many ways, and they were convincing me that I should really smoke this cigarette, and I said no. And one of the guys finally came up with the, with the right idea. He said, Jack, if you'll take one drink of this wine, we will, we won't bother you anymore. He said, you're going to like it so much, you'll just take one drink. And I thought, that's okay. I'll take one drink, and that'll be the end of it. And I took a drink of that wine and passed the bottle back in the front seat and settled back down in my corner of the back seat. And about two or three minutes later, I don't know what the time frame was, this sort of felt the tingling sensation go right down to the end of my fingers. And, and it went right up to the, the centermost part of my mind. The world just started really coming alive a little bit, and I felt like that I had something important to say that they needed to hear, and I said, George, pass that bottle back here. <laughs> this was not like what my father had done, not at all. This was a good thing, a joyous thing, something that brought excitement and pleasure. It was a mind-changing, a mood-changing, and these were not the words that I applied that moment, it just felt so good. I couldn't resist it. I can tell you this. If prune juice had made me feel that way, I would have had a real problem. <laughs> you see, my alcoholism was already underway. It was not something that took place over a period of time. The addiction was already in me. And I knew that I would return again and again to this delightful experience, this joyous experience, unlike the unpleasantness. Why? The way I felt was so different. And besides, I could already do it better than George and John and Grip. They had been drinking for quite some time, obviously, and they were not receiving the benefits of the wine that we drank like I did. I had just started, and I was great. Effort. That was the beginning. And I need not tell you how that over the next years, more and more I relied upon another drink if something was not going exactly right or if I had some 
some experience that needed a little extra desires on my part, I kept a bottle in the locker when I was in high school, and we played ping broke. We had a tough bunch of guys. I'd go back at halftime and take a couple of drinks and come back out, and it seemed to me like I'd just blow them right off the basketball floor. But that was an illusion, of course, in my own mind. Drinking never, ever caused me to, to be superior in anything that I did. One of the experiences, one of the symptoms of alcoholism was fear. The increasing fear that became a living part of my life. Fear. Agoraphobia. Unreasonable fear. And of course, all fear is unreasonable. Those of us who are in the program, if you get your big book out and begin to read it again, page after page after page, you'll be amazed at how much is said about fear as a symptom of our alcoholism. And the recovery from fear is being a part of the, of the process of getting well. If we are not recovering from our fear, we are not getting well. I would read to you from page 84 about fear. And this is only one of the very brief insights. We have entered the world of the spirit. Now, this is after the process of recovery takes place. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for a lifetime. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God to remove them at once. But fear is symptomatic of the progression of our disease. We experience fear in so many of its forms. There were moments when I would awaken in the middle of the night panic-stricken, almost in a catatonic state of with the inability to move a muscle, fear. The fear of doing the simple thing that I had to do tomorrow. On Friday night, I was already being afraid of Monday. You understand what I'm talking about? On Sunday night, I was terror-stricken about Monday. And I was afraid to acknowledge that I was afraid. The sense of impending doom. I knew that my life was coming apart. I did not know how or when or even why. But fear. Fear, 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 fear. Alcoholism. Fear. Fear. Time came when it controlled my life, and yet... I was unable to even admit to myself that I was afraid. That is hell, my friends. I can remember the first Sunday nights when I was so afraid of Monday mornings, I would frequently be reading, escaping, listening to the radio. There was an organist that played that time on CBS, and it was on a network radio show. And he played his organ, and someone read poetry in between pieces that he played. And I would sit in my living room Sunday nights listening to this poetry, take another drink, and I'd hear a sound in the basement. Now, I always knew that I had locked the basement door, I thought. But I had this fear of someone entering the house through the basement. And I would stomp on the floor, and finally I would go to the basement door and open it and slam it and lock it quickly. Then I would shout down the basement steps, I'll be down in a minute. And finally, I would continue to hear these sounds. And so frightened that I cannot describe to you my fear. And yet with the compulsion to, to do what I had to do, I would walk down those basement steps, afraid that this person in the basement would take a sharp knife or an axe or some instrument and cut my leg off as I walked down the steps. Does that seem unrational to you? If I had this experience one time, I had it a hundred times. My life was coming apart. And this was only reason for me to drink more and hide it from you more. And not let you know what was happening inside me. Well, that day I awakened, and as I told you, and in time arrived in California, but already I had the sense of impending doom because... I knew in my heart of hearts 
that when I arrived in California, that my life would be the way it was when I left Virginia. I hoped that there would be a difference. But I knew that it would be the same. But I was prepared when I got there because I had put together my resume and sent my resume out to do the proper channels to seek a position, not a job, and, and with some good reason because when I left the company in Virginia, I was probably the leading salesman in the nation with that organization. I was the top one or two bouncing back and forth. And yet one of the primary reasons that I made the decision to move to California was that my accurate sense of impending doom told me that if I did not quit, they were going to fire me. Now, how could they fire their, one of their top salesmen? Because of my unacceptable behavior, because of my style, because of my influence. If they put up with me, then they would put up with anything. So I left that position. Some years later, I bumped into one of the other district managers. And he said, uh, Jack, when you were fired by our organization. I said, John, what do you mean fired? I wasn't fired. He said, well... Gosh, I was sure you were. I was in an organizational meeting one day, and they told me that you were going to be relieved of your position. And I can tell you to this day, I never mind. I quit. My The keen, cunning mind of the alcoholic always came to my rescue at just the proper moment, so I seemed to make for a long period of time the exact and proper move. In other words, what I'm saying to you is I kept falling up. Alcoholics are the only people on this earth who fall up, and I fell up. Now, I want you to know that you can only fall up so far. And my falling up was over when I arrived in California. In spite of the fact that sending out these resumes, I very quickly began to get some responses and, and had some interviews, and there was one company that was my first choice, and there was another company that was my second choice. One day, the company of my second choice, the vice president from Chicago, called. said, Jack, we've checked you out. Your record back in Virginia was just great. Um, the territory in Southern California, where you are, um, will just be a marvelous opportunity for you to display your many talents, and I'm sure that you'll be quite successful for us. The salary that we're offering happened to be the largest salary that I had ever earned. The expenses that you will be getting will more than cover your needs, the bonus that will be yours on a semi-annual basis in the company car. I desire. But the king coming out of the alcoholic came to my rescue. And I accepted the position. And the next day, the company of my first choice called, Vice President of New York, and he said much the same thing, offered me a salary that was more than I had ever earned before, so I, I was confronted with two salaries, two almost unlimited expense accounts, Commission on top, and a company car. And I was just about to tell him that I was sorry, but the day before I had made a commitment to accept a position with another national organization, but the king cunning mind of the alcoholic came to my rescue and that sense of impending doom. And I said I would be glad to accept that position. Well, why not? The territories overlap. There was a position there was no direct supervision. I was my own supervisor. Two salaries, two company cars to drive, two expense accounts. You think we don't fall out? Now I want you to know something. If you believe that I had trouble getting to work in Virginia, I want you to know that I hardly ever showed up in California. I try with everything that was in me, I try. Didn't work. My life, the fear, the uncertainty, the anguish, the anger, the resentment. I never had it so good outwardly, and I never had it so bad inside where I lived. A month ago, Karen and I were in San Francisco, and we asked some friends that we know to have dinner with us, and we selected a restaurant that we, a branch of which we had dined at in Honolulu. And it happened to be in the 
Look around the hotel. The Fairmont Hotel. And so we were in this restaurant, the Fairmont Hotel, and as we were seated in just the right booth, and I want you to know that one of the great things that I have experienced in my life has been that I've always been at exactly the right place at exactly the right time to have the wonderful experiences that I needed to have at the moment. The hostess ushered us to a table by a window. And when I was positioned in just such a place, the only position at that table, that I could look out at the hotel across the street. And as we talked during dinner, Something kept triggering my mind. My mind. See, that hotel across the street was the place that, a little more than 30 years ago, at a sales conference, I really made an ass of myself. Even I knew it. I knew that the bottom was falling out of my life. Flying back from San Francisco to Los Angeles and following that sales conference 30 years ago. I recall hoping that the plane would crash. If I believed in God, I would have prayed that the plane would have crashed. I did not want it to land. I wanted to crash. You think I was interested or concerned about the other people who were aboard that plane? Only myself. All the arrows pointed toward me, my own fear. The plane did not crash, of course, and the following weekend, I was at a party that was given by Tennessee Ernie Ford, who happened to live not very far from me. We had come to know each other somewhat casually, and then we became even closer because we were both from the same hillbilly part of the East. This night at the party, he was speaking to and singing to a group of people, and I was standing about there, and there were two drunks right up here. Now, if there was one thing that I hated, it was a drunk. Uh, a, a smart aleck kind of drunk. And these two guys were giving my friend Tennessee Ernie Ford a hard time. And standing there, I shouted to these two alcoholics that if they did not shut up, I told them what would happen to them momently if they did not. And when I looked up at my friend Tennessee Ernie Ford standing here for approval, except I did not get approval from him. He was not concerned about them at all. He was handling them quite well. But as he looked at me, it was a moment of truth. And I tell you that you're a recovering alcoholic. You probably are not here unless somewhere along the way there was a moment of truth, a moment in which you clearly saw in your own mind or through the eyes and mind of another person what was happening to you. And as he looked at me, suddenly all of the defenses seemed to fall from my mind. All of the buffers, all of the carefully laid and structured thoughts that had prevented me from beholding myself in my own eyes fell away, and I saw myself. And I left the building and went quickly home and put the car in the garage and took the garden hose and cut it off and stuck the one end in the exhaust and the other end around and put the cloth there and sat there with my bottle of vodka that I drank because no one could tell that I was drinking it and sat there waiting for the end to come, and it would come quickly, and I was glad that it would be over. You see, I knew something about being on this planet. There was no hope for me, and I knew something that you did not know. There was no hope for you either. There was no hope for anyone, and it would be over quickly. And as minutes passed, and my body began to lose its ability to control itself, but my mind was very alert, I found myself about to fall over in the seat on the right, and almost fell, and and with the last strength that I had, the last ability to control my body, I pushed myself over against the left and could barely get my left hand up and somehow found the doorknob and pulled it just enough so that the weight of my body forced it open and I fell out into the driveway, into the garage, unconscious. And some two or three hours I awakened and turned off the ignition and, and obviously I lived. Monday I called. The vice president of my first choice and told him that I was had a wonderful offer back in Virginia. See, one of the symptoms of alcoholism is that we can never bear to tell the truth. And I told him that I needed to go back in Virginia because not only did I have this marvelous opportunity, but there was a very important member of my family who was quite ill and needed me there. 
Now, who said, Jack, I'm, I'm really glad that you're going because there's something really wrong with you and you need help. I did not hear it. I called the vice president of my second choice and told him that I was resigning and gave the same story. And he said, we're glad that you are because we were considering releasing you. See, I kept calling up. I went back to Virginia, took my three sons and my one wife, and turned them over to her family. And I went back to the city of my birth, a small southern town, to die. I knew that I would die in a short time, either directly by my own hand or indirectly through this experience that was taking place in my life. Now, I did not know that I had a drinking problem. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Drinking was not my problem. Sometimes I had a problem getting something to drink, but drinking was not my problem. I found myself living on unemployment compensation, which in Virginia in those days, and probably still is not very much, it was $22.50 a week then. And you can't drink on $22.50 a week. I promise you that you can't. I tried. Can't do it. I sat in the park lots of days thinking about all the people that had put me here. Attending my funeral. My funeral was imminent and I spent a lot of time going to it in my own mind. I may be the only person in this room who's ever attended their own funeral. I can tell you this, it was a lovely occasion. <laughs> Sitting in that park, I wanted to be a squirrel. I would have given anything to have been anyone except me. Isn't that incredible that tonight I'm so glad that I am me, so grateful that I am me. I wouldn't change places with anybody on this planet. Of all the people on this planet, I think I'm the most blessed. I think you think you are, but I know I am. I watched those squirrels, the boy squirrels would chase the girl squirrels up and down those trees, and, you know, they had acorns on the ground, and People came and fed them peanuts. They didn't have to strive for survival like I have. They had no fears, no anxieties. They came out in the morning and the sun was warm on the branches and they would stretch themselves and claw and dig and look around as though they owned the earth. Every now and then a boy squirrel would catch a girl squirrel and there wasn't anything happening in my life. There was no one to turn to. No human being left for me to turn to. I had, I had run out my string. And this one Sunday night, I stopped by the post office, and here I was living in the most unpleasant part of that town. The part of town that I had run from, that I had sought to escape from, the part of that town that I had lived in when I was 10 years old and knew that I would never be back to because I was would never be like my father. I was going out to be successful and to reach the top. My dreams would be fulfilled. And here I was, back there. And more than being back there, unable to function, unable to work, unable to live, unable to die, and I was bumming. Not for a living, but for something to drink. I didn't call it that. I called it borrowing. This night I went down to the post office, the very same place that so often I had gone on Sunday evenings to post my expense account. And I stood around there hoping that someone that I knew would come by that I could borrow something from. Now, hoping that they would and hoping that they would not, too, because I was so ashamed. Do you think that I enjoyed being where I was? No more than you would at this moment. I did not know why I was there. And no one came by the post office that I knew that night to me to tell my lie to and touch for five dollars or fifty cents. I would have settled for anything that I got. As I walked away from the post office, so desperate and so hopeless that I cannot put it into words for you, I walked to the, to the corner and, and I've taken Karen and showed her this very spot. And the light changed and I tried to walk across the street and I could not. 
I was immobilized by fear, the sense of impending doom. It was more than that. It was a feeling of listlessness. There was no place for me to go. There was nothing for me to do. My life, my useful, meaningful life was over. And the tragedy was that it was over before it ever really got started. And I tried to turn around and go back in the direction from which I had come. And I could not move, and I tried to go to the right and to the left, and the light kept changing, and I stood there, and stood there, and stood there, and finally I crossed the street, and turned to my left, and turned the corner to my right, and when I did, I saw Joe. And the timing was perfect, because Joe was just walking out of the doorway with about four or five other people. Now, Joe is that person that everybody has in their mind. Joe is the guy, or the gal, that if you ever get as bad as he is, You'll quit. So every alcoholic has a picture of what an alcoholic is. And an alcoholic is something that that person is not. Someone whose symptoms, someone whose pattern of living is quite different. And Joe was an obvious drunk. I carried Joe home so many times from so many poker games and so many bars. Now, in Virginia, we had an expression, carry someone meant drive them. Can I carry you where you want to go? May I drive you? Well, I drove Joe home, and then I carried him in the house. I always carried Joe home and took him back in the bedroom and took off his shoes and his jacket and commiserated with Jean, his wife. Then I went back down to Silver Gables, my our favorite hangout, and told the guys there, if I don't get as bad as Joe is, I'll quit. He's an alcoholic. When we got kicked out of the country club at the same time, for the same event, except it just wasn't for that one thing. It was for several things. It was the night that we got in a fight on the dance floor, and it was with his brother-in-law that I got in the fight, and I did it for Joe. Got the picture? For Joe. He's an alcoholic. Now, I walk around the corner, and here's Joe walking out of a doorway with four or five other people, and I have stumbled away from the post office trying to bum some money to get a drink. And here's Joe in front of this doorway, and on it there are two letters, A-A. And I said, poor Joe. Poor Joe, he's an alcoholic. I knew it all the time. Do you think I identified him with me? He came across the street. We went around the corner. He bought me something to drink. I told him the wonderful story of my experience in California. I was only back because my grandmother was ill. Going back next week, I was temporarily out of funds. I could use a few bucks, and Joe and I had always exchanged money and booze. Two weeks later, I called Joe. One of the most difficult things I've ever had to do in my life. I went to a telephone, a pay station. I didn't have a phone. Backed off several times, and finally I got through, and I said, Joe, are you still sober? My whole life depended on Joe being sober. He said, I am. And I said, and I want you to hear this. I said, Joe, there must be something wrong with me. I can't get sober. He said, where are you? And short time later, he came and he brought his friend and my friend, Bud Moore. And Joe never really made it. See, what I did not know was that night he stepped out of that doorway. He had only been dry for two weeks. Joe never, ever stayed sober. But he was standing there for me. It was the precise moment that he walked out. When I crossed that street, I did not turn to the right. I turned to the left. If I had crossed at my own will, when the light first turned green in my favor, I would have missed him. I believe with all my heart that you are here. Because you were given the opportunity. And if you look back, you will see... This magnificent series of serendipitous events that were always working in your behalf and that were designed by a power greater than yourself that loved you and cared for you when you did not qualify for that love at all. And here was I, a smart aleck, atheist. Joe came across the street. But it was Bud who later came to share my experience in the sobriety. I called Bud more this week. And Karen was there when I was talking to him. And he and I agreed that without each other, we would not have made it. And yet we also agreed that if we had not had each other, that this divine intelligence would have provided another bud for me and another jack for bud. Joe, 
<laughs> How I love him. Remember the time that I won his father's 12-gauge double-barrel Parker shotgun in a poker game. Joe was half drunk and thought he had the winning hand and he was broke and we were playing in his father's house because his father was in Florida. And he put the gun up and I won it. Joe spent two or three years trying to get that piece back for me and if you know anything about weapons, that double barrel Parker in a special case had never been fired. It was very valuable. I never did give that gun back to Joe. I traded it for a fifth of vodka. Do you believe that I was insane? You believe it? Well, I started going to meetings. AA meetings. And as a matter of fact, I stole a key to the clubhouse because I lived in such fear, such terrible fear. The first job that I had was a job selling second-hand cars for a tricky second-hand automobile dealer. It was not he did not sell the kind of cars that you wanted your mother to drive, I can tell you. If someone drove on the lot, I would step around behind the shed and hide because I was so frightened. If you're afraid of people and you have to sell used cars for a living, you've got a problem. And I had a problem. A problem of survival. I had a thousand things in my life to do and not the energy to do one of them. And so one day, the keen, cunning mind of the alcoholic again came back to my rescue because I decided to do the last thing I knew to do before I just finally laid down and died. Fear and worry and hopelessness. I decided to pray, but if I'd called it praying, I wouldn't have done it. I lied and took one of the cars off the lot and drove out to a place beside the Roanoke River. And I've taken care of there and showed her this place and there... So full of anxiety, I did the smartest thing I've ever done. I prayed. Now, my pulse was racing, and I looked up and down the street to make sure that no one would catch me doing it, because atheists don't get caught praying. And I started off just right, because I said, God, I don't believe that you exist. And I didn't. But if you don't exist, there's no hope for me. I knew that I could not make it without some divine help. And I said the magic words, the words that had been impossible for me to say. I said, help me. Do you know that I, had, in my life, had never asked anyone for help? Not directly, not in those words. I said, help me. And the moment that I spoke those words, help me, a remarkable thing happened because suddenly in my mind, help became a different thing. Help had always been to get you to do something for me that I should be doing for myself. Or help was an unexpected Income tax return check in the mail. But help meant change me. I realized the first moment in my life that unless I was changed, I said, don't give me a better job. You know, it came to my mind that help might be that I'd get a better job. I was scared to death handling the one I had, the worst job I ever had in my life, and I wasn't doing it. And I said, no, no, no. Change me. Make me over into the person that I was supposed to be. I did not know what that meant, but I became willing to be changed, and for the next seven or eight or nine or ten minutes, with all of the earnestness at my command, I spoke with feeling and with the willingness to be changed. And I realized that all of those people that I had blamed were not responsible at all. For the first time, I was willing to assume total personal responsibility for myself. A strange feeling, a strange concept. Something was happening to me. Now, I must pause here and correct one thing I said. I did not forgive them all. I did not forgive Garnet. Tell you about Garnet. My prayer was over and nothing happened. And that was Thursday. And Saturday, I did what the keen cunning mind of the alcoholic told me that I needed to do. I went into the next county and got in a poker game because money was what I needed. God did not exist, but money did. And if I just had enough money, and so I took the money that I had and my checkbook just in case and lost all that I had and wrote some hot checks to some people that you don't write hot checks to. Are you getting the idea that I have changed in these last few years? I lost everything, came home Sunday morning so depressed, despondent, turned on the radio in this car, this old junker of a car that I was driving, and there was a preacher 
Dr. Norman Vincent Peel, and who wants to hear? I didn't want to hear Dr. Peel and turned off the radio, but I heard a voice anyhow, and I checked to make sure the radio was off, and there was a voice that was speaking to me, and the words were, perfect love casts out fear. And instantly, I felt so much love that I couldn't stand it. I really couldn't stand it. I was loved with an everlasting love. I did not know how afraid I was. And had been all my life the sense of apprehension that had plagued me from the time of my youth was suddenly gone. I want you to know that it is possible to live without fear. I would not have believed it. But it is possible as the result of these steps, as the result of the healing power of God when we ask for it, willing to be changed, willing to surrender our old ideas. You see, the last thing we'll ever give up is our suffering. Long after I stopped drinking, I was still clinging to my suffering. And all of you al know what I'm talking about. The most long-suffering people on earth are al -Anons. Tonight, are you willing to give up your suffering? If you're willing to surrender it, it will go if you ask for help. It will come to you. Many things were revealed to me, and I was shown inside my mind that the experience that I was having was the result of the prayer that I prayed. And more than that, I was shown that I had, without being aware of what I was doing, because the people in my AA group had not discovered this big book. If they did, they were keeping it a secret. If anyone knew about the 12 steps, they did not let the word out. They had not carried the message to me. That group was seven years old, and the longest sobriety was 15 months from a guy that had come down from Brooklyn. And I think he was ready to move back to Brooklyn from that group. We did not have a program of recovery in that group. But it was revealed to me that I had fulfilled the conditions for the experience that I had had. I had admitted my personal powerlessness. I became willing to turn my will and my life over to the care of a power greater than myself, even though I did not believe that that power existed. And I made a decision. And I took an inventory. And I forgave every other person except Garnet. Well, I want you to know that my life came alive that day. It was not a religious experience. It was a spiritual experience. I came to believe what the big book says on page 42. That spiritual principles would solve all my problems. And I had so many problems that you would hardly believe it. There was no area in my life that was not critical in the sense of having problems. But I became so excited about this process and I went into action and miracles happened to me. The most incredible things happened to me. I could spend hours and hours telling you about the unbelievable things that happened as I got honest in different areas of my life and went into action in that area in my life. That's what made AA so exciting. It was not just physical sobriety. It was the fact that I now had in my hands the tools and the power and the divine intelligence that, for which I could take no credit to create, to build the kind of life that I had always wanted. And if you're in AA and you've gone to meetings and heard a speaker say that all this program promises is physical sobriety, I want you to know that that person is misinformed. It offers you everything in terms of your growth and of changing and of the magnificent experiences that can and will be yours if you will work for them. The big book says if you will work for them, if you go into action and believe them, they will occur. And I know that that is true. Dramatic things were happening to me, and I felt so good I could hardly stand it and was filled with excitement. And one day I was driving over the bridge under which my father had died from his alcoholism. Many years before. I can remember the moment. I can even see the traffic patterns before me. In spite of my recovery, that morning, I had lost my temper. Lost it like pretty good. Because I was still enjoying losing it. I had also picked up the Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox and had been reading on page 52. And if you have never read the Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox, let me urge you to get it. And on page 52, I read something that you might not see there. As I drove across that bridge, remembering what was on page 52, the Sermon on the Mount, 
I was thinking about the marvelous changes that were ahead of me, by great things that were out in front of me. And the voice spoke to me again and said, not unless you forgive Garnet. You see, Garnet was my brother-in-law. And in my active alcoholism, I had planned his demise. I never did like Garnet. And that was the best we ever had. Our best moment was when we first met. And it went downhill from that time on. And Garnet did some things that he should not have done that altered my life. And I started thinking about it and planning it. And, and I worked very hard to concoct the perfect crime. And perfect meant that I was going to undo him permanently. But perfect also meant that Garnet had to be aware that I was the one that did it. I had to work out so I wouldn't get caught. But I never had quite figured out so that if I didn't get caught, that Garnet would know it, that I had done it. Are you getting the picture that there was a little something wrong in me? There were a few screws that were turned. And now this voice is telling me that I have to forgive Garnet. And I said, I won't do it. And the voice said, you will. And I said, I won't. And the voice said, well, it's for you. It's not for Garnet. And I said, oh. <laughs> it's for me. And I want you to know that the program is for you. And the surrendering of the suffering is for you. And the forgiving of other people is for you. It is not for them. Each of these steps is guaranteed to bring about a remarkable change in you. But then I knew that I had God, that no one could forgive Garnet. There was no way that I could forgive Garnet. And I said, I don't know how to do it. And then I was shown how to do it. My youngest son, Alan, was two years old and had long, red, curly hair, locks that had never been cut. And I loved him dearly. And, and the presence said to me, pick Alan up in your arms and love him. And so later I picked Alan up in my arms and, and I just loved him, loved him, loved him, loved him. And then the voice said, now switch it to Garnet. And I switched it to Garnet, the love, and it quit. And then I said, aha, I told you it won't work. But my instruction was to continue to do it. I loved Alan, and I had to love Garnet with the same love with which I loved Alan. And day after day, I worked on loving Garnet. One of the most difficult things I've ever had to do in my life. And you understand what I'm talking about, because you've got a Garnet, or a Geraldine, or somebody in your life that you have wanted to fix. And you'll never forgive them because of the terrible thing that they did that made your life what your life was. Right? Well, I worked at it because it was for me. I knew that my progress would stop, that I could not go beyond a certain point. And one day, in switching my love from Alan to Garnet, it didn't quit. Now, I didn't like him. But I understood that Garnet was like I, that he had done the very best he possibly could with the circumstances that existed. A short time after that, I was driving along in this old automobile that I was trying to sell, and a new car, a new Buick or Oldsmobile, I don't remember which, passed me on a four-lane road, and I was shown Karen at very spot. And I looked, and it was the most beautiful car I think I ever saw. You know how we are about new automobiles, particularly if you don't have one. And as I looked at that car, thinking, gosh, I'd love to have one like that, it got out in front of me about 15 feet. You'll never guess who was driving it. Garnet. But instantly, I was glad that he had it. I wanted him to have it. And the tears ran down my cheeks. See, before, I would have wanted to have run him off the road, and now I was glad that Garnet had it. And the program was working. And I knew that if I could forgive Garnet, that I would never hold a resentment against any human being on this planet. And I can tell you that for 30 years, I haven't. I haven't. You think that's not a miracle? That's not a miracle? I wanted to kill him. I loved him. And not long after that, a very short time after that, Garnet had a heart attack, and he died. But you see, I was able to go to him before he may had that attack and make my amends to him while he still lived. Asking for forgiveness on his part and telling him that I would do everything I possibly could, I could do to correct the terrible things that I had said about him to others, the lies that I had told. And I did that for my own recovery.
Is my life ever exciting? You bet it was. And it is. As a result of these principles in my life. Time passed. Dramatic changes took place. I believe in change. I believe in growth. Not just the kind of growth that's inside us where we live so that there is this continuing process of self-examination and evaluation and the awareness of the defects that still exist and, and putting them off by becoming willing to be changed. That is, for me, the most exciting process that, that we have. But I also believe in the miracles of being able to create ever more joyous and abundant lives for the benefit of those people that we love. I believe it's possible to prosper and to grow and to become more successful and more capable and more efficient as the result of these steps. I think that's a part of the promise that's made to us in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it happened and happened and happened. The time came for my 10th AA birthday, my 10th anniversary. And Bud Moore, whom I called this week, was the president of the company for which I worked. We were best friends, and we were members of this marvelous fellowship, and we had co-sponsored each other, you might say. Bud and I were given an invitation by the vice president of the Norfolk and Western Railway to join the president, the vice president, and a number of people in the community who were being acknowledged for some civic good that they had performed in the preceding year. I really did not want to go. It was the time of my 10th birthday. I was quite busy. I was taking an inventory of my life. And I did not feel that I deserved to be there. I, did, I just did not feel that it was the place for me to be. But at the last moment, I decided to go. And Bud and I boarded the train. The plan was that this group of business people would join the vice president on two private railroad cars on the end of a train that would be going west. It's about time for the train to leave the station, and we got on board, and, and the vice president met us. It's quite possible that the reason that we were there was that we had helped his brother into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. That might have been the civic duty that we had performed. He turned to the porter and said, John, Mr. Moore and Mr. Boland will have coffee, meaning they're members of Alcoholics Anonymous. See, my anonymity has never been a closely held secret, and having it exposed has never hurt me at all. It was time for the train to leave, and the vice president took me into the second private car. There was a, a dining table in the center of each of these cars, and he said, Jack, you will eat here, and he was introducing me to some people that I had not met. There was a jerk. The train was leaving the station, picking up speed. Then suddenly I remembered. That's not correct. I did not remember. I felt presence with me that reminded me of an event when I was 10 years of age when I sat beside that same railroad track desiring with all my heart to be on a train going west so that I could be away from these people whom I was ashamed so that I could be moving into the experiences that I wanted in life and here I was at the time of my 10th AA anniversary, on that train. Is that a coincidence? And this presence had positioned me so that I was looking out of the railway car toward Shenandoah Avenue, and we were at about 5th Street and 6th Street and 7th Street, and I knew that in a moment, in just a moment, I would be looking at the very spot on which I prayed that prayer as a child. And in that prayer I had said, Oh God, is it possible for anybody to love me, a little boy like me? And the miracle was that not only was I loved by scores of people, in my heart there was not hatred toward any person, but that I could love. And I did love. And in a moment I saw that very spot. And I cried. I stood there and sobbed and cried so hard in the presence of Men that I did not know. Was I ashamed? Proud, grateful. I'm so grateful for this fellowship and, and to have you 
in my life. I stood here yesterday and invited the members of this congregation to come here tonight to hear this story. On the first anniversary, the editor of the local newspaper in the city of my birth brought me this prayer that had just come over the wire services. And in closing, I'd like to share it with you because I believe it's the essence of what I have found, what I seek, and what I believe the program offers. It's a prayer of a chief of the Dakota Sioux. O great spirit whose voice I hear in the winds and whose breath gives life to all the world, hear me. I come before you, one of your many children. I am small and weak. I need your strength and wisdom. Let me walk in beauty. Make my eyes ever to behold the red and purple sunset. Make my hands respect the things you have made, my ears sharp to hear your voice. Make me wise so that I may know the things you have taught my people, the lesson you have hidden in every rock. I seek strength, not to be superior to my brothers, but that I may be able to fight my greatest enemy, myself. Make me ever ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eyes, so that when light fades, as a fading sunset, my spirit can come to you without shame. I really am so grateful for the light that has been given to me. And for all of you here and that vast, vast, wonderful group of people who are not here, who have made and who continue to make my life possible. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.